Can I retire at 55 with $1.4 million saved for retirement? That's what we're going to talk about today on this live stream. We're actually going to go through a really in-depth study of can I retire at 55 with $1.4 million saved for retirement? I actually want to go through three specific scenarios, and I'll show you those scenarios here before we get into it. I want to go through a retire at 55, no Roth conversions. I want to do a five-year Roth conversion schedule. And I want to look at a five-year Roth conversion scenario when taxes go up. So we're going to go through three specific scenarios to determine, can this person retire at 55 with $1.4 million? How can they save on taxes? Will their money last for their lifetime? And are there other things that they need to address within their retirement planning? So let's get into this right now. Let's go into retire at 55, no Roth conversions. That means we're going to leave all of our pre-tax money, pre-tax. We're going to leave all the investments as is, and we're just going to see if we can retire and, and what do we need to do. So here's what we got. <clears throat> We've got Gary Beavers. He wants to retire at 55, no Roth conversions. It's actually Jerry, not Gary. <laughs> Jerry lives in New Mexico. Uh, he was born in 1969, which makes him 53 years old. We've got about a $10,000 current gross monthly salary. So that's before taxes are ca calculated into it. Jerry has Social Security at 62 of 2094. So we're going to look at that and determine, does it make sense for Jerry to take Social Security at 62. Now you remember, if you take Social Security at 62, you're only gonna get 70% of your full retirement benefit. If you take Social Security at 67, you'll get 100% of your full retirement benefit. And if you wait till 70 to take Social Security, you'll actually get 124% of your full retirement benefit. So for him, we're looking at 62 for a couple different reasons. The first reason we're looking at 62 is because that's what Jerry wants to do. Jerry wants to take Social Security early. He has a uh, an infinity for taking Social Security early. It's something that he definitely wants to do. And the reason is because he, one, doesn't think Social Security is going to be able to pay full benefits for the rest of his lifetime. And two, he wants his money now. So we're going to look at that. Does it make sense for Jerry to take Social Security at 62 based on the retirement plan and based on taxes? Or does it make sense for him to push those to 67 or 70? Now, Jerry is single. So we've got, we're, he's looking at one to take Social Security at 62, but Jerry is single. So as a single individual, the only income that he has coming in is on Jerry. It's me, myself, and I. And we're going to get to some assets here in just a second. We're going to look at assets and how much he has saved. But when it comes to guaranteed income for Social Security, that's the only guaranteed income that he has at the current moment. And it's the only guaranteed income that's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government and has a COLA increase. You know, the average COLA increase for Social Security is 1.88 percent. And that's going to go up with Social Security. I think I saw the projected COLA somewhere around 2.4% now. So that's actually really good. So we're going to see a projected COLA increase of actually higher than what the software is showing. Now, Jerry doesn't get a pension, so there's no pension benefits within his planning. So the first thing we're going to look at for Jerry is, should we take Social Security at 62 or should we push that? But let's go through all the assets and some of the tabs here before we get into that. So from an asset standpoint, Jerry's got most of his money with us at TD Ameritrade. Now, he does have a freedom fund. We've talked about freedom funds a lot on this channel. He's got about $475,000 in his freedom fund. Now, you might be thinking, what is a freedom fund? Is it a mutual fund? Is it an ETF? Is it some kind of stock? No, no. A freedom fund is a taxable brokerage account where you take your extra savings and you put that in there and you invest that for retirement. And what that allows you to do is that gives you the freedom to take retirement income whenever you want. It gives you the freedom to manipulate your retirement date to maybe earlier than you would if all your money was in pre-tax or even Roth IRA accounts. And so the freedom bucket of money allows Jerry to say, hey, if he wants to retire 55, 
I can do that. And do I have the amount of assets that are needed to carry my retirement income from 55 to 59 and a half? And then at 59 and a half, I can get into all the other assets that I have, like 401ks, IRAs, SEP IRAs, whatever, without having to worry about a 72T, a rule of 55, or a 10% penalty for taking out money under the age of 59 and a half. So we have this freedom fund of $475,000. Now, from a retirement income standpoint, how we have these vehicles classified is how we're going to withdraw them. Okay, so from a withdrawal standpoint, we are actually going to start when he retires. We want to use this freedom fund, this four hundred and seventy five thousand dollars or whatever that's going to be when he gets to fifty five. We want to use that first for retirement income. So we're trying to hedge fifty five to fifty nine and a half with the freedom fund. Then we'll start working on the SEP, the IRA, the Roth IRA and the bank. The bank, we're not gonna touch. The bank's gonna stay where the bank's at. That's the last, that's our emergency fund. And the Roth IRA, obviously that's tax free. And we're gonna talk about Roth conversions on this video. But the reason we wanna keep the Roth IRA is last is because again, over the long term, taxes are probably gonna go up. So if we can have Roth IRA money on the back end for retirement income, that's going to be the best bet for Jerry. So we're going to start with this freedom fund. That freedom fund gives you the ability to retire whenever you want. Now we have a SEP IRA because he is self-employed valued at $205,000. He's doing a $2,500 monthly contribution into his SEP IRA. We have a traditional IRA that's about four seventy five dollars as well. We have a Roth IRA that's $222,000. We're putting $584 into that on a monthly basis. And we have a bank account of $50,000. And so the bank is our emergency fund. This is where he does not want to go below. This is about a year's worth of expenses at this point. Now, these are just household expenses. Jerry does have a business. He has a farm. We're not including the farm, the business, the um, mechanical stuff that goes along with the farm into this plan because that is could be sold, but it's got to be sold at market value. It's got to be sold at what somebody would pay for it. So what I wanted to do for Jerry was say, okay, Jerry, with what you've got now, with the contributions that you're making currently, can you retire if you kept the farm, if you couldn't sell anything? Because I don't know what the housing market's going to do. I don't know what the farm market's going to do. I don't know what machinery the market's going to do in two years when he gets ready to retire. So that's why we've left off protected assets like the farm, like the machinery and things like that. So we're only looking at his assets. Now, from a rate of return, okay? So the money that's in his assets, right? The money that's invested for retirement has to earn something until we get to retirement and then after retirement, right? It stays invested. So we are currently gonna run it at 6%. So that means that the money that's in the market, the money in the Freedom Fund, the money in the SEP, the money in the IRA, the money in the Roth IRA, it's going to earn 6% a year. Now, what we're going to look at at the end of these tabs, when we look at the market, this 6% is not going to be granular. It's not going to just go like this. We're going to look at different rates of return for the market. But over time, we're going to look at earning 6%. Now, the difference with Jerry is Jerry's a very conservative guy, hence cattle rancher from New Mexico. Very, very conservative. And so after retirement, he wants to take his investing down. So that means he doesn't want to try to earn 6%. He really wants to protect his assets as much as possible. So we're going to look at a 4.4% rate of return once he gets into retirement. So right now, think about it, his investments are at 6%. That's what we're trying to earn. All we're gonna do is downshift to 4.4% the closer we get to retirement. We're gonna make that transition for him. Now the assets might become a little bit more income-minded. They might become a little bit more guaranteed. We might use an annuity or something like that. I don't know, we're not there yet. But we're gonna downshift the investments to get a lesser rate of return, but to protect the overall assets, okay? So 4.4%. So if you look, the portfolio weighted average right now is 5.79%. That's before retirement, okay? Current tax classification, we've got $1.4 million. 47% of his money is pre-tax, meaning when he takes money out of this account or when he takes money out of his portfolio, 47% of that is pre-tax. So let's just say, 
every $4.70 out of $10 that he pulls out of his portfolio is going to be gross income. It's going to be ordinary income. Okay. The rest is going to be either Roth, which is tax free, or it's going to be interest, dividends, capital gains. Okay. Which is more efficient right now. So 10 or 15%, depending on where your income is at, probably more in the 10% range for him once he gets into retirement. Now, from a risk classification standpoint for Jerry, Right now, he's got 96% of his money at risk of market loss. But we just talked about, we just talked about this portfolio weighted average, right? And we talked about how we're going to try to earn 6% for the next two years, but how Jerry's more conservative. And so as we step into retirement, we're going to downshift these investments. And so once we get into retirement, the risk classification is going to go more towards 58% low risk, 38% at risk, and then three and a half percent emergency fund. Okay. So that's kind of where we're at from the standpoint of taxes and risk. Okay. So we've got about what do we got? $1.4 million today. Um, I think once we get to retirement, it's about 1.6, but let's look at expenses. So from an expense standpoint, currently Jerry's got $4,000 in personal expenses. We're going to give that a 3.24% inflation rate. Now, if you look at inflation history, obviously we haven't, you know, haven't factored in 2022 in here yet, which is going to be about the seven or eight percent. But if you look from 1914 to 2021, it's right at 3.24%. That's the overall inflation rate for the historical average. It's going to be a little higher, obviously, with 2022. But if you look at over 30 years, it's probably going to fluctuate a little bit for Jerry. So, again, we're just going to use a historical average for that. All right. So if you go to cash flows, Jerry is going to retire at 55. OK, his biggest expense at 55 is going to be health insurance. It's going to be how much in health insurance or how much is health insurance going to cost me from 55 to 65, right? Now he's a single guy. So what we're going to do is we're going to put about a $500 monthly premium into his plan for health insurance. So what we do is we put in $500. It's going to be for health insurance and we're going to give it a one and a half percent increase. So what that means is his health insurance premium, you see this cash flow, it's going to go up every year until he's 65, right? Because our health insurance goes up. I mean, I just got my bill. Health insurance is going up on us. And so we want to calculate that into the plan. Healthcare is the biggest cost. Listen, guys, healthcare is the biggest cost that you will face in retirement outside of housing. And housing, depending on the part of the country you're in, is could be the second, third, or fourth cost on your list, right? In Florida, housing is very expensive, especially if you're on the coast, um, property insurance, taxes, things like that. So housing in Florida is more expensive. Health insurance for our family family of five is coming in a close second to our to the cost. And so that doesn't change in retirement, especially if you retire in your 50s. Maybe you're going to have more health insurance needs in your 50s. So healthcare is important. And that's why we want to have that calculated into our financial plan. So let's look at taxes. Let's go to 2023. Now, the purpose of this live stream is the, this this scenario right now is retire at 55, no Roth conversions. We're gonna go through three different scenarios today. One, retire at 55, no Roth conversions. Number two is gonna be retire at 55, but do five years of Roth conversions. And the third scenario is gonna be retire at 55, do the five year Roth conversions, and then what happens if taxes go up? Because what we can do essentially, so he's in the 13.96 projected federal tax, uh, projected 3.63 with the with the state of New Mexico. So projected federal tax. If you look at the bracket tracker here, so he's in about the 12% bracket. He's got a little bit of money that goes into the 22% bracket. But for the most part, after deductions, after credits and things like that, his projected federal rate is 13.96. Now, what I like to look at is say, okay, what's it going to be when you get like longer into retirement, right? Once you're in your 70s, maybe in your 80s. Well, it's only going to increase a little bit, 14.27. But here's the kicker, guys. Here's what we don't think about. That's based on today's tax code. Today's tax code, which is the Trump tax code. If When does that tax code end? 2025. So if that tax code ends in 2025, 
how do we project out what taxes are going to be in the future? How do we as a fiduciary, as a financial planner, put a plan in place for tax planning if we don't know what taxes are going to be after 2025? Listen, I've been doing this 16 years. I have had one, two, four different tax codes in 16 years. And so we've got to have a plan for taxes going up. And the way we do that, and we're going to get this, we'll get into that in the very last scenario, is we go to brackets and we go, let's increase these. And let's increase them in the year 2026 because that's when they would increase. And if we increased them just by, let's just double them. So if we just say it's a 100% increase, so the 10 goes to 20, the 12 goes to 24, the 22 goes to 44. If you look at that, now we're in the 32% bracket. Now, is that realistic? Probably not. But as our national debt goes up, as the cost of our social programs go up, like Medicare, Social Security, SSDI, things like that, then taxes are going to have to go up just to pay for a lot of those things because we don't do a very good job of cutting spending. So we need to have a good idea what that's going to look like in taxes. And we're going to go go through that here in just a little bit. So let me get back to the normal scenario. All right, 14.27. Okay, perfect. So now that's taxes. So if we look at pre-retirement, this is what he's going to be saving. So we've got gross monthly salary of $10,000. There's his monthly contributions. Here's his net monthly expenses, right? This $633 is extra money that's left over and that's flowing into that freedom fund. Okay, remember we have that freedom fund right here. See this freedom fund? That's the freedom to do anything you want, retire early. And so that freedom fund is going to allow him to retire at 55. And I'm going to show you what, how, how we're going to do that. So that green money there is extra money going into his freedom fund. And so now what we're looking at is saying, okay, how much are we going to have at 55? Well, for him, he's going to have $1.6 million saved for retirement at 55. And you can kind of see how this goes. If we look at how the accounts are per year, here's 2023, right? Deposits and withdrawals. There's our contribution for our Roth IRA. There's the contribution into the SEP. And here's our interest. And again, we're just trying to earn a 6% rate of return until we get to retirement when we're going to slow that down. Fast Eddie says this. He says, the government is living paycheck to paycheck. I don't know if it's paycheck to paycheck. I don't know what the, I think they're operating at a deficit for the most part. I think, I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not on the, uh, what do they call that? The government accountability office, whoever the nonpartisan group who, who tracks the budget. But yes, you're right. The government has to make some changes. Um, obviously for just whatever we need. So let's go to retirement. So this is the this is the key. Like how long is our money going to last? And the red line for the financial EKG shows us, are we going to run out of money? So in his case, the red line is showing that we're running out at 98 years old. Now that's pretty good, right? Jerry's a single guy. He's 53. Odds are he's probably not going to live to 98 years old. So 98 is probably pretty good. Now, let me show you some of the positives, and then we'll go through this in detail. So if you look at this, the amount needed today to avoid a shortfall, meaning the amount that Jerry would need to influx into the plan to never run out of money, is about $84,000. Okay, so if he had an extra $84,000 lying around, he could influx this into the plan, and he would never run out of money. And remember, the rate of return that we're trying to earn on this is 4.4%. And so the rate of return needed to avoid a shortfall in his plan is only 4.65. And so 4.65 is what his portfolio needs to earn in order for him to never run out of money. And we're running this at 4.4%. So that means we need an extra 0.25 a year just to never run out of money. So you can see why I'm not necessarily concerned about this because it's not a huge deficit in the sense of we got to have a huge influx of money or we need to earn seven, eight, nine percent a year. We only need to earn 4.65% and he never runs out of money. And let's talk about the Freedom Fund for a minute. Remember, Jerry's going to retire at 55. So he doesn't have a 401k. So there's no rule of 55. Now, remember, the rule of 55 is this. If you work at your current job and you have a current 401k, if you leave that job, you get terminated or you get fired, in the year you turn 55, you can actually use your current 401k for retirement income without paying a penalty. 
Okay, you still pay taxes on the money, but you don't pay a penalty. Okay, so he's 55, but he doesn't have a 401k. All his money's in SEPs and IRAs. So if he was retiring and all his money was in a SEP or in his IRA or in a Roth IRA, he would have to do a 72T. But Jerry's been doing a really good job of building up his freedom fund. And so if you look at this, let's go line by line. So this is the year 2024. He is retired. We've got $508,000 in his freedom fund. Okay. We need about $48,000 a year for uh, expenses. Now that's been inflated for age 55. So now it's $4,378 per month. Now, what I love about this software is it actually does your monthly expenses, it inflates it on a monthly basis, right? Because like eggs cost different prices per month. And so we want to look at that. So his current expenses when he gets to retirement is 51,778. He started at 48,000 and now we're at 51,778. And so let's look at this freedom fund. Let me show you this. 2024, we've got $508,000 in his freedom fund. So that's 55. We go to 56. We've got $467,000 in the freedom fund. Go to 57. $420,000 in the freedom fund. Remember we started at 508. At 58, we've got $369,000 in the freedom fund. And at 59, we have 312. We go to 60, we're at 250. So boom, we have broken through, okay? That, that five-year kind of treacherous 10% penalty on my IRA, rule of 55, 72T, what do I do? He did it because of the Freedom Fund, because he had put money away, not just into his IRAs, not just into his Roth, not just into his SEP, but he took extra income. He put that into a taxable brokerage account. He let that money grow over time, and now he has bridged the gap from 59 to 59 and a half, and now the world is our oyster, and we're able to use all of our investments for retirement income. Now, he does kick on Social Security at 62. That's 2,094. We talked a little bit that, about that at the beginning. He really wants to get his Social Security early because he doesn't believe that the government is going to be able to sustain the payments. Okay, Whether they can or not, I don't want to get into that discussion today. That's not what this is for. But $2,094 is what he wants to pay. He wants in Social Security starting at 62. Net monthly expenses have gone up. There we are at 5,473. So the red line is not necessarily bad. What the red line means is he's just using his assets for retirement income. And as you can see, we actually grow our money. At about 75, we've got $1.7 million. Okay. He doesn't start to see his money go down until about 76. And that's because our expenses have increased so much. And so we get to 85. And we've got $1.2 million. Now, here's what I want you to look at. We put the Roth IRA. See this Roth IRA, $1 million. We made the Roth IRA the last bucket we're going to use for retirement income. So we're still using that traditional IRA. Obviously, we're having to take required minimum distributions out of it. Starting for him, it would be age 75. Okay, so re the required minimum distributions, if you are... Uh, close to 72 now or 71. I think it's for this year. I think it's 2030. I have to look at the SECURE Act to be 100% correct. But 73 is the current RMD age. It gets moved to 75, I believe, in the year 2030. Uh, you can check me on that. It might be 2033. But for him, by the time he gets there, it's going to be 75 is when he has to take his required minimum distribution. So at 85, we're still using his IRA okay, for retirement income. So let's go to that. Let's go to 2054 real quick. So here you can see from a tax standpoint, all right, his gross income is 129,902. That's his taxable withdrawals. That's what he needs for income plus his required minimum distribution. 50% of his social security benefit is being taxed or it's being used in the computation of his taxes. So social security, once you hit certain thresholds, the government starts to count in your social security as taxable. Okay. So it, it could be 50%. It could be 85% because he's single. They're going to count in 50%. And so they take your gross income, they add in 50% of his social security benefit, and that's his provisional income. Depending on his provisional income, that's how much his social security would be taxed. Right now, his social security is 85% taxable. 
meaning the computation of it is at 85%. So his federal gross income is 162, his taxable social security and his taxable withdrawals, 162, 685. I want you I want you just to pay attention to this. Lean into taxes a little bit. Don't fall asleep on me with taxes. Cuz I can gloss over taxes all the time cuz taxes to me are like, "Oh my gosh, I hate taxes." But taxes are so important when it comes to your retirement income. And so for him, at 85, his federal tax due is 29,000. He's in the 24% tax bracket, okay? Because we're still using that IRA for income. Now, let's see where that IRA goes away. Now look at this. We've, we've gotten rid of the IRA. So at 87, we've used that, we push that Roth IRA to the last bucket that we're gonna use for retirement income, all right? So we withdrew the Freedom Fund first, to get us from 55 to 59 and a half. Then we started working on the pre-tax money at 59 and a half, meaning his IRA, his SEP IRA. And the reason I did that early was because taxes were lower, okay? And he wasn't having to have a required minimum distribution. So let's try to get through some of that pre-tax money so it doesn't build up so much that when we get to those RMD ages, we're taking out a ton of money getting taxed on it. And what we did was we pushed his Roth IRA bucket to the last withdrawal that he's going to use because that money's grown tax free, right? Compound interest is God's greatest gift outside of Jesus, right? So we've let that Roth IRA compound for all these years. And now we've got $1.4 million at 87 that's tax free. So let's go to his tax year for 87. Remember at 85, he was in the 24% tax bracket. Look at this. Now, we're in the 14%. So we've gone back 10% in his federal taxes because of just how we have set up his structure. Again, I'm going to show you Roth conversions. Hang on. If you're watching this live or if you're watching this on replay, hang on because we're getting ready to get into Roth conversions and I'm going to blow your socks off on what this is going to do for Jerry tax-wise. Okay? Now, we run out at 98. I feel really good about this plan. OK, Jerry still has some protected assets like his house, OK, like a business, like machinery, like agriculture that we're not including in this plan because we just are trying to be real conservative. Jerry's real conservative, doesn't necessarily know what it's going to sell for, if it's going to sell, how it's going to sell. So we're just going to leave it at zero. So when I show him this, I say, hey, Jerry, at 98 years old, you're out of money, not including some of the stuff that we've been talking about that you don't want included in the plan. We feel really good about this, even if that stuff wasn't included in the plan. This is a really good plan running out at 98. Remember, all he has to do is earn 4.65% for the rest of his life and he never runs out of money. And we're running it at 4.4%, okay? So let's look at the different scenarios. So we just ran through retire at 55, no Roth conversions. And so we did that because I wanted to see what his tax situation would be right now. So let's go to, let me, let me show you this real quick. Let's go to reports. And this might be jumping ahead a little bit. But if we retire at 55 and we do no Roth conversions, his lifetime taxation would be $707,000, meaning from today, 53 to 98, he's going to pay $707,000 in taxes. And that's, that's, at the, that's at the current Trump tax code, which is a very generous and low tax code. We're going to talk about taxes going up. First, we're going to talk about just doing conversions. But this is the number I want you to think about, $707,000 if we don't do any Roth conversions. Because a lot of times people will talk to me and they'll say, hey, Drew, Roth conversions are too expensive. To do a Roth conversion would cost me too much money. And I would say it like this, between now and 2025, we have a very low and generous tax code. So doing Roth conversions now makes a lot more sense because we don't know what taxes are going to be in 2026, let alone what they're going to be in 2036, 2046, or 2056. And so the risk is you do no Roth conversions, taxes go through the nose, which I'm going to show you that as a scenario, and we can't do anything about it. We're just going to pay, 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 or... What you can do today is you can say, all right, I'm going to do Roth conversions. I'm going to get this done because for me, where I'm at right now, I don't want the risk that I'm going to be taxed out the wazoo. 
I want to do the conversions now so that I can prepare my future self with tax-free income. Okay. So let's look at that. So here we go. So we're looking at a scenario, five-year Roth conversions, and pretty much everything's going to stay the same. Okay. Still making the same salary, still getting social security at 62. We're going to come back to social security a little bit to see if it makes sense to push it to 67 or 70, but that's not really the point of this live stream. The point of this live stream is taxes, 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 and Roth conversions. Okay. Because they are so, so important. And, and it's so important for you to see the benefit in doing this, okay? And this is what we do in our EKGs. We get detailed. You know, what you see on YouTube sometimes is just a 30,000 30, foot overview. We get down into the nitty gritty, which is what I'm wanting to do today, is get into the nitty gritty for you. And listen, if you want an EKG, if you want me to run a financial plan for you, go to the description of this video, click on the checklist to retirement. You'll see it says free download. Get that. Select the box that, yes, I want to visit with Drew. And let's do it. It's also in the comment section right here. It says free retirement download. Get that. And let's talk. Let's get you to retirement, through retirement, and protect your ability to stay in retirement. We're talking about protecting our ability to stay in retirement. So our assets are going to stay the same. We've got the 475 in the Freedom Fund still, 205 in the SEP, the IRA, the Roth, and the bank. Here's the difference. We're adding in a Roth account. So this is going to be a Roth holding account. And so the money from our Roth conversions that we're going to do over the next five years is going to flow into this account. Now, the reason I'm going to keep them separate. So you have two five-year rules with Roth IRAs. The first five-year rule is if you do a contribution. So if you put money into a Roth IRA as a contribution, you have a five-year waiting before you can take out the earnings without paying a penalty. You can take out your contribution at any time, but you have to wait on the earnings. We're doing conversions. And I deal with a lot more conversions than, than people having issues needing their money when they're doing contributions. Because normally when we're doing contributions, my clients who are doing a lot of Roth contributions are younger. And I make sure if they're putting money into their Roth, unless it is a, an astronomical emergency, we're not going in there to pull it out. Okay. With a conversion, it's a five-year waiting period on all the money you convert for each individual conversion. Okay. Let me check that again. So if you convert money in 2023, you got to wait five years before you can touch it, right? Because there's no contribution to a conversion. All that money's pre-tax. If you do a conversion in 2024, it's a new five-year window. So we've got two five-year windows now. We got to keep track of that, okay? So what I'm doing on the simplicity for the software, we're just going to have one Roth holding account. But what I would encourage you to do if you're doing Roth conversions, this is what I do for my clients, we open up multiple Roth IRAs. And we let the money flow into a new Roth IRA so we can designate the five-year rules. And we can say, okay, this one's done. And then we start combining them. Once all the five-year rules are done, we start combining them to make it simple for clients again. But right now, we got to keep them separate, okay? So the same is applying for his rates of return, okay? So 6% is going to be the rate of return. 4.4 is going to be the after retirement rate of return. The Roth holding account is going to go the same way. So 6% is what the Roth holding account is going to get now. 4.4% is what it's going to get after retirement. And if you have any questions, I don't know if I said that. If you have any questions, put those in the comments. Would love to answer those for you. Okay, so now let's go to the Roth conversions. So we still have health insurance in there. So we're not, we're not going to bypass any of the cash flows that we had to do the Roth conversions. We're still retiring at 55. We still need health insurance at 55. So now we're doing the Roth conversion. So Jerry's going to do a five-year Roth conversion. We're going to do this annually, and it's going to be $50,000. Let me show you what this looks like. So we're doing a five-year Roth conversion, $50,000. It's going to start in February of 2023, and we're going to go to February of 2028. Okay, We're going to move this out of his TD Ameritrade IRA. So we manage a TD account for him. We're going to take it out of there. We're going to put it into a Roth holding account within TD Ameritrade as well. Here's the thing, he's actually going to, uh, the TD IRA is invested, okay? It's invested in ETFs, okay? We use ETFs in our portfolios. He's invested in ETFs. We're not gonna sell those ETFs and then move the cash over. It's what it looks like here because this is what the software is saying. But what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna move the stock over. So he's gonna have, I'm just gonna use VU as an example. He's got VOO, $50,000 worth of VU, the stock, the ETF, we're just going to move that over into his Roth account. So nothing is sold 
right? Nothing is bought, nothing is sold. And he doesn't lose out on any market uh, uh, fluctuations. What's really nice right now, think about it. The stock market is down about 20, was down about 20% last year. If you have stuff in your IRA, stocks, mutual funds, ETFs that are down, right? Which, as most of us do, unless you own energy or maybe some consumer staples or something. If you have stock like Apple stock, Tesla stock, something like that, and it's down 20, 30, 40, 50, 60%, think about doing Roth conversions because what you're doing is here was the stock in 2021. Now it's here in 2023. Move that puppy over to your Roth IRA. And now as the stock appreciates again, you've eliminated, right? A lot of this money that, that you would have had to pay taxes on if you did the conversion because you're looking at some of the lower priced stocks. That's just a little food for thought. Fast Eddie says this, Drew, will I get a will will I get fees charged on each Roth account? I think you're saying Will I get fees charged on each Roth account? No, there's not from a, from doing the conversion. There's there's not a fee to do the to do a Roth conversion. What we're trying to do is just move it from one IRA to the Roth. IRA. Most custodians will do it without without fees. There's there's not a fee on it. If your custodian is charging you a fee to do a Roth conversion, you need a new custodian. Okay. Now here we go. There's our fifty thousand dollars. Let's go to pre retirement. So he's still working. OK, still working. There's our there's our Roth conversions. Now we've got one point five million dollars at retirement. Remember, in the last scenario, we had one point six. But the reason it's less is because we've paid taxes. Right. So if you look, go to twenty twenty four gross income. OK, deductions, taxable income. Federal tax rate's 14.9. It's gone up. Now, his taxes owed are 21,000. Additional taxes are 20,000, right? Mm, that's not right. Showing a penalty there. I'll have to get rid of that penalty. But let's assume the penalty. They're, they're saying that you're moving. Because we've eliminated those taxes later in life, and that's given him an extra year of income. Still a really good plan, but now he lasts an extra year. How awesome is that? Doing the Roth conversions gives him an extra year of retirement assets. 4.48 is what his portfolio needs to earn to never run out of money. Now, remember, it was 4.65. So it was 0.25 is what he needed to earn extra because we're running this at 4.4. We do the Roth conversions and he only needs 0 0.08, eight tenths of 1%, okay? it's pretty good. Now let's go to retirement. Okay, so let me show you something. We're doing the conversions. There's the Roth conversions, okay? Now remember, he's 55, we're using that Freedom Fund. So we're gonna use that Freedom Fund. Now we had to use some of that Freedom Fund to pay the taxes. So we don't have as much Freedom Fund as we had before, we're at 506 in the original scenario to retire at 55 and not do Roth conversions. We're at 480 now, okay? Because we've used this Freedom Fund to pay some taxes. But let's look at it. We're doing the conversions for these five years, 57, 58, 59. At 60, we still have 136,000 in our Freedom Fund. So our Freedom Fund is still doing what we want it to do, even doing the Roth conversions. The Freedom Fund has been set up so he can retire at 55 and not have to do a 72T, not have to get a 10% penalty on his taxes. We're able to go from 55 to 60, and we're able to do that without having to tap his IRAs. Now, remember, there's his SEP, there's the TD IRA, there's the Roth IRA, and here's the conversion, 366334 So when we get to this year, we've done, we're done with our Roth conversions at age 61. 
And we've got about, what's that? 332, 382. Let me do the math on my calculator. 332 plus 382. We've got about $714,000 in Roth IRA money now. Okay. Originally, we didn't have that on the original plan, no Roth conversions. And again, if you're just, if you're joining me late, make sure you go back to the beginning and watch this where we have no Roth conversions. We still just had the 332 in Roth IRA. Okay. So what's cool about this is let's go to here. And what we're using is, so he's, let's say it's 70 years old. Now we've got $322,000 in our IRA. Okay. We're going to use that for income because the way we set up our withdrawal order is we're going to use all of our pre-tax money first. So we're trying to get our pre-tax money out of the way first, and then we're going to get to our Roth money. So let's see when our IRA will run out. Let's see. IRA. There we go. So at year 74, so at 74 years old, near 2043, he's got $68,357 in his IRA. Now we go to the next year at 75 years old, we've got $1.3 million in Roth IRA money. That's pretty good. So from 75 to 99, everything is going to be tax free. So look at this, go to 74. And if you look at 74, federal gross income, there's our deduction, taxable income, right? We're in the 22% bracket. Our federal tax rate's 4.23 or 14.23%. That's at 74, okay? Let's go to the next year. Actually, let me close this. Let's go to 2045. Now we look at this and our federal gross taxes are zero. Because we have everything's Roth IRA or the bank account. Doesn't matter how much it earns. Doesn't matter about capital gains, interest, and dividends. Our tax bracket's 10%. Our federal tax rate's zero because we've got $1.4 million in Roth IRAs. Our state tax, zero because we've got $1.4 million in Roth IRAs. So you see how, how this can be beneficial. What Jerry's doing is he is paying the price up front doing these Roth conversions, right? Doing these transfers from pre-tax to post-tax. He's paying the taxes, okay? What year is this? Let's look at year 2026 and then let's look at year 2046. So let's look at 2026 real quick on taxes. So 2026, under the current tax code, his projected federal tax rate is 16.65%. OK, because we have our monthly cash flow, we have a taxable withdrawal of one thirty five eight oh seven, of which fifty thousand dollars is a Roth conversion moving from IRA to Roth IRA. So now let's go to twenty forty six. And we're at zero. You see that we still need money. We still need retirement income. It's not that we're not using retirement income, but our taxes are at zero. And what's cool about this is. Let's say taxes go up double, and we're going to look at this in just a second. Let's say taxes go up. So that means, let me go back to that. Our current 10% goes to 20. Our current 12 goes to 24. Our current 32 goes to 64. Our current 37 goes to 74. Drew, taxes will never be at 74%. Go back to the 1950s when the top tax rate was 90. Now only 2% of people actually paid that, but... It was still there. 2046, taxes have increased. He's still at zero. Why is he at zero? Because Roth IRA money. What a beautiful thing. He paid the price up front, paid the taxes. It didn't cause him to not retire at 55. He still wanted to retire at 55. We still did it. We still had our freedom fund. We just used some of that capital that we've been saving for income to pay the taxes. And boom, we're able to retire at 55 and our money runs out at 99, okay? That's a pretty good scenario. I would say that's really good. Now, here's what I want to show you. Let's go to reports here real quick. This is what's killer, okay? This is what gets me excited. Look at this. Retired 55, no Roth conversions. His lifetime taxation, 707342 $707,000. That's doing no Roth conversions, meaning the money stays in IRA, SEP, Roth, bank, freedom fund, all that. 707. Okay. Runs out at 98. 
right? So if we look at it, he's out at 98 years old. Not a bad thing, but he's out at 98. Five-year Roth conversions. Five-year Roth conversions and taxes staying right where they're at today. Okay, obviously, I, I don't think taxes are going to stay where they're at today, but we're just we're going to get to a tax increase. Five-year Roth conversion, his lifetime taxation, $407,000. And we're out of money at 99 instead of 98. Does it hurt a little bit to pay the taxes up front on those conversions? Yes, he has the money to do that. And so the conversation has been built around the risk is that today taxes are low and we don't do any conversions and then taxes go up in 2026 because we don't know where taxes are going to be. Look, how what's the difference? Is that like 300 grand? That's like close. It's like $299,000 difference by doing a simple Roth conversion. And let me tell you something, if your advisor is not talking to you about this right now, call me. Remember, if you want to get in contact with me, if you want to do an EKG, in the description below, download the free retirement download. It's called the Roadmap to Retirement. Click on that. You can actually select the box that, yes, I do want to talk to Drew. You want to skip all that? Click my calendar link in the description. Get on my calendar. Let's have a conversation about Roth conversions for you. Okay. So I know you guys see this right here. Five-year Roth conversion taxes going up. Let's talk about that. Let's go through that scenario real quick because it's a little different and it's a little bit where we need to land. We're going to land the plane right here. All right. Let's go to scenarios. Five-year Roth conversion taxes go up. Okay. So... Everything's staying the same. There's our salary, social security. We're going to take it 62. Everything's staying the same. Let's go to taxes. So now what we're going to do, oops, wrong box. What we're going to do is we're going to increase the brackets. We're going to double them. Okay. Now, I don't know where taxes are going to be. Okay. I mean, they could just go up 50% from where they're at today, 10 to 15, 12 to 18, 22 to 32. This looks like more of the Obama era tax code, which is where we would fall, right? If they didn't renew taxes in 2025, we'd fall back to the Ob Obama tax code, which is kind of like this, okay? But what I want to do is I want to say we got a $31 trillion national debt. We've got more boomers retiring than we've ever had. So they're on Social Security. We've got Medicare that needs to be funded. We've got disability, Medicaid, things like that. And again, I'm not against those programs. I'm just saying we got to pay for those programs, right? And we've got money that's going out. We're not cutting spending. And this is not a government lashing or whatever. I'm not, I'm not telling you I'm against the government and what they do. We have to control our spending because the programs that we have promised to our citizens are there and we've got to pay for them. So taxes are the way the, the way we do this. The SECURE Act that was just passed, the SECURE Act 2.0, which is awesome, pushes the RMD age to 73 and then 75 later in life. It also allows if you have a SEP IRA to put it into a SEP Roth IRA, which wasn't allowed beforehand. Now, obviously they, they still got to write the rules and, and the custodians have to agree to all that. But what the government wants now is revenue. It needs revenue now. So if we're smart about this now, we should be able to get to retirement and have a lot of tax-free income. Because if we're smart and we go, I'm putting it in my Roth 401k, I'm putting it in my Roth SEP IRA. Employer contributions can be on the Roth side as long as your income's not too high. If your income's over a certain level, they still make it go on the traditional side. But if it's below a certain level, your employer contributions, Roth side. We, we might have a generation of Americans get to retirement and not have to pay any taxes. Govern I don't know if the government thought about that. So here we go. We're going to double the taxes. Okay, we're going to double them. Now let's look at what happens to Jerry. So let's go to this year. We're still doing the Roth conversions. Okay, now we're in the projected federal tax rate of 16.87. Go to 2024. Let's get a full year in. 2024, 14.9. Now, 2025, 16.24, still under Trump, the Trump tax code, okay? Now let's go to 2026. 
doubles because we're doubling taxes. We're doing worst case scenario, 33.39%. First shot first says this, not many politicians run on a platform being fiscally conservative and tightening the belt. Doesn't really, doesn't, uh, yeah, no, it, it's true. And, and again, I'm, I'm not against politicians and I'm not saying that I'm one way or the next. I just kind of look at the data, right? I look at the data and say, you know, they call it saber metrics in baseball. It's, a, it's, it's all data driven now. And I'm a huge baseball fan. I live in Tampa. We, we, we cheer for the Rays down here, which is tough because it's the AL East. And the AL East has gotten really good as well as seems like a lot of baseball has gotten really good. But Saber Metrics is how you grade players based on statistics and just looking at ne- never watching them, but looking at statistics and looking at spreadsheets and understanding, you know, if they hit the ball hard, does it go in play or does it go to a does it go to a fielder? You might have a great average, but it's an out every time you hit it. Well, that just means you're hitting the ball hard, but you're hitting it where somebody's standing. So that's Saber Metrics saying, OK, this guy hits the ball hard, but maybe we just need to get him to hit it somewhere else hard. The Rays do a great job of it. I'm just looking at the data. 31 trillion in debt, so- Social Security 2033 is when we need to make some adjustments on that. Medicare in a couple of years, honestly, we need to make some adjustments. And so again, that's why we're looking at this in the planning, in the EKG, in the financial EKG, we have to have a realization that taxes are gonna increase and taxes are gonna go up. So let's look at that. Now we've increased taxes, we've doubled them. So let's go to retirement for Jerry. Now, remember, we were out of money in 98, 99. I'm going to bring this, I'm going to wrap this in a nice little bow for you before we end this. So don't, you don't have to remember all these numbers because I'm going to put this in a little bow for you. Okay. A little bow for you. All right. So we're out of money at 91 years old. Now his rate of return needed to avoid a shortfall still low, 5.25%. Remember, we're running this at 4.4%. Because he's a conservative guy. Jerry's a conservative investor. He wants to be at 4.4. We only have to earn 5.25. The market's averaged eight for the last 50 years, 60 years with inflation. So if we can just get a little bit more, he's not going to run out of money. But look at what happens when taxes increase. Taxes increase and he loses eight years of income, right? Still taking Social Security at 62. Still doing our Roth conversions. But now we get to 75, we still have our Ross, so we're still not paying any taxes on it. But because of the higher tax rates at 26 and beyond, we're running out of money early. So one of the things that we would look at for Jerry is say, hey, man, taxes changed. Maybe we don't do these Roth conversions right here. Maybe we don't do year 26, 27, 28, or... Matthew said this, unfortunately, it's too late for me. I wish I'd done things differently. I don't know how old you are, Matthew, but if you're doing Roth conversions, you can do those at any age. And so for what we're looking at here is we might say, okay, Jerry, instead of $50,000 a year, how about we bump it down to 25? What about 20? What about 15? And then we just extend the schedule. So what we're going to try to do is we go into the EKG, Like we law, I mean, if you're a client of mine, this EKG, we keep forever because I'm looking at this going, okay, can we make adjustments? So let's go to year 2026 and we go to the bracket tracker and I say, oh man, you know, year 2026, you're going to be in that 22% bracket and you're eating into a little bit of that 24% bracket. So what we need to do is maybe adjust the conversions and get you back down into here, into this 12% side. Okay, and we'll just extend out the Roth conversions, because, again, for Jerry, he's still got that freedom fund, that freedom bucket of money that's going to get him from fifty eight five to fifty nine and a half. So we're not going to have to worry about the 10 percent penalty. We're not going to have to worry about 72 T's. But when taxes go up, there's an issue. So let me put this in a vice bow for you. Matthew says I'm 62. 62. I don't know what your financial situation is, Matthew, so I don't want to go out on a limb too far, but you can still do Roth conversions. It can still be within your planning. I do a lot of Roth conversions for people after they're retired. It's just this just comes to what we do because when you're earning a paycheck and you got a high income, maybe it doesn't make sense to do a Roth conversion because you're in a high bracket. But then you retire and you you need less money, and in Jerry's case is from this freedom fund, we can do some Roth conversions in a lower tax bracket. OK, so don't don't think you're too too old to do conversions. The only thing you got to remember on conversions is you have the five year rule. 
for each conversion, there's a five year wait before you can touch that money without penalty. Um, and so that's why we always recommend doing multiple Roth IRAs if you're trying to do conversions. So let's let's kind of put this in a nice little bow for you. So here's retire at 55, no Roth conversions. Here's retire or here's retire at 55 with five year Roth conversions and taxes don't change. And this is five year Roth conversion and taxes go up. Now, if you're just joining us, if you're new, if you haven't seen the whole thing, go back to the beginning because you're going to see how we can do this with Jerry, how we can retire and the different scenarios we want to go through. So we're going through the worst case scenario is taxes doubling. But look at this. The first scenario, we do no Roth conversions. His total lifetime taxation is $707,000. Okay. We do a five-year Roth conversion and taxes don't change. His lifetime taxation is $407,000. It's a $300,000 difference just by doing Roth conversions. Yeah, yeah. You paid a little bit up front. You paid twenty grand up front. But over the lifetime, you save $300,000. Now, five-year Roth conversion and taxes go up. Lifetime taxation, six hundred four. dollars so we can look at these two scenarios here and we can say, well, we can save $103,000 in lifetime taxation, right? By doing the Roth conversions, even if taxes go up. Now, the caveat is this. We do no Roth conversions, we're out of 98. And that's if taxes stay the same. We do a five-year Roth conversion and taxes go up. Remember, we're showing taxes doubling. Now we're out at 91. So there's a seven year difference. Remember, if we do Roth conversions and taxes don't change, we're actually out at 99. It actually extends the life of the, of the, of the plan. So now we got to go back to this plan. If this is something that's concerning and say, okay, Jerry, do we work a few more extra years? Do we allocate our investments differently? Do we try to grow our money a little bit more? Do we take social security a little later, which I don't want to get into all that because I've been going 57 minutes. I got three minutes and I'm going to eat turkey sandwich. So we've got to figure it out. But this gives us what we're trying to do is set a foundation and say, OK, based on these scenarios, which direction do we want to go? And that's why we want to build out the EKG. We cannot make these decisions without a financial plan, without an EKG. You can't do this. You can't say, should I do a Roth conversion? What's that going to do to my lifetime income? What's that going to do to my lifetime taxation? You can't do that without doing a plan. You can't read a Forbes article and just say, oh, yeah, it tells me to take Social Security at 70. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I literally read an article today in Barron's. When should somebody take Social Security? And they're saying, take it at 70. That makes the most sense. How do they know? Is that your plan? Are they living your life? Do they know how much you have in retirement assets? Are they retiring at your age? They don't know. You got to do it based on your plan. That's what we do with the EKG. Again, if you want an EKG in the description below, get one. Let's talk about it. So this is what I really wanted to show you today. I'm going to hang on for about another minute, minute and a half, two minutes to see if you guys have any other questions. Uh, Matthew says, took Social Security Two months ago, I have about a million I need to convert. Listen, 62 years old, it's not about the big, big amounts, right? It's about doing the little amounts and letting the little amounts just compound over time. You know, one of the great things when I played baseball, now I played college baseball and somebody asked me yesterday, what level did you play college baseball at? And I said, well, there's division one, there's division two, there's division three, there's NAIA. And then I was below that. So I went to school for education and I got to play baseball, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, and th those years were amazing. And I wish I could go back every day. I wish I could go back. But in baseball, you have the saying where you're going through a hitter slump. And when you're going through a hitter slump, you cannot get on base for anything, right? You might hit the ball as a, a line shot off the bat, feels great. The guy in left field makes a dive and catch. Daggummit. Or you might roll the ball over to shortstop and he might just easily throw you out at first. But then there's that one plate appearance and you get up to the plate and you go to swing the bat and you're out in front of it and you make a really ugly swing and you hit the ball. And the ball just kind of bounces towards the second baseman and it hits a rock and it bounces over his head and you get on first base. And you know what my grandfather would say about that? 
He said, hey, Drew, when you look in the box score in the newspaper the next day, looks like a line drive to me. And that's all you needed. You just need to get on base. And then that next plate appearance, you get up and you rope a double into left field gap or into right field or whatever. OK, same thing with conversions. Just do a little bit at a time and they're going to compound over time. OK, first shot first, that says, do you recommend paying the conversion tax out of pocket? Yes, don't pay your conversion amount out of your IRA. If you're under the age of 59 and a half and you pay your conversion taxes with your IRA, you will pay a 10 percent penalty. Do not do that. Pay it out of pocket. Make sure you have cash flow in order to do that. Let me show you that. So when we're looking at this scenario, let's go to the Roth conversion scenario. If we go to pre-retirement, so you see how he has net monthly cash flows that are positive. So we're going to use those net monthly cashes, cash flows to pay the taxes that he's going to need. And we're going to use his freedom fund. Okay. In order to do that. Good question. Real good question. All right. If no other questions, I'm going to eat my turkey sandwich. Y'all have a great day. Thank you so much for watching. Come back for the full catalog of videos. God bless.